Okay. Welcome to the Tennessee Native Plant Society's uh, seminar, Native Plant Seminars series that we're doing monthly on the third Tuesday of the month. And this month we have for our speaker, Bart Jones, who is quite knowledgeable about our native orchids. And uh, among other things, Bart is past president of Tennessee Native Plant Society. He's past president of the uh, Memphis Orchid Society. And I'm sure he's got plenty of other accolades that we can could heap on him, but those are the pertinent ones today. Uh, I'd like to say hello to everyone. Welcome. I'm going to ask that while Bart's talking that you please click your mute button. That's the button down on the lower left corner and you want it to be red. You want it to be red in color. Mute button to be red. Lower left corner, click on it so it turns red. And that means there will be less feedback, uh, less extra noise. So it makes it easier for all of us to hear Bart. And if you have a question or a comment, please put it down in the chat box, which is probably the middle of your screen down at the bottom. And um, you can put it in there and then when Bart's finished with his talk, what we're going to do is uh, Bettina and I will be feeding Bart some of the questions and comments that people have made during, during his presentation. So Bart uh, recently did an article for the, I don't know if it's gonna show up, Tennessee conservationist, no, it's not gonna show up. The Tennessee Conservationist. He has a nice article in there on the native orchids of Tennessee. Um, so be on the lookout. There's some good articles in the Tennessee Conservationist. <laughs> and without further ado, I'm going to say, Bart, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Uh, thanks, everybody, for. Uh joining us on the Zoom seminar. I uh, hope this will not disappoint you too much. <laughs> I'm gonna try to uh, remember to talk slowly and hopefully you can hear me clearly over a few passing planes and uh, any other kind of noise. The cicadas may start in here in a minute. So just try to ignore all the jungle sounds, but um, we will go on with the uh, wild and wondrous world of orchid pollination. Um, so people have been interested, oh, hold on, this is not, there we go. Uh, people have been interested in orchids for hundreds of years. And during all this fascination, uh, people noticed that a lot of orchids had very specialized uh, methods of, of being pollinated by insects usually. And uh, so people really began to study them. So orchids have always been more of a scientific endeavor in the plant world for a lot of people. And so a lot of scientists soon really started to look at how these uh, plants were being pollinated and, and the methods that they were using to kind of uh, utilize insects and have them do their bidding. And so that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. And, uh, to start with, I would like to kind of go over the basic parts of an orchid flower because you're going to hear me use terms throughout the talk and I want to make sure that you kind of understand the basic parts that we're talking about. So this is a Calipogon tuberosus or a grass pink and it has um, basically six floral uh, petals or tepals. Uh, there's two petals that come out from the sides. There are three sepals but there's also one petal that's been specialized. It doesn't look like the rest of the uh, petals, the other two petals, and that we call a lip. Uh, in tuberosis, or in calipogon here, you uh, have the lip at the top, which is not the usual arrangement that an orchid has. Uh, these are called non resupinate and means they haven't turned upside down. So in reality, most orchid flowers that you see presented are, are upside down and the lips at the bottom. This one in, uh, for you know, purposes of its pollination has remained upright. And so it doesn't twist during the bud formation. 
But the lip is the attractant. That's where a lot of specialized features occur on the flower. And those are the things that are going to attract the insects in. Uh, orchids are unique and what is um, defining for the family is the structure of reproduction, which has become fused. So you have male and female parts fused into one structure called a column. You know, in most plants you have stamens and anthers for the male part and the pistil and style for the female parts and the ovary, of course, where the seeds are located or the ovules. And uh, in an orchid, you have the pollinia and the uh, style and uh, stigma all into one structure and it's called the column. And on the left, you can see the ovary is inferior. So it's below all the other parts of the uh, flower. You can see this up close where the column has both the male and the female areas. So the stigma is kind of hidden underneath these flaps. You can't really see it, but that's where the sticky surface is where the pollen is going to attach and where the pollen will then form the tubes to go down into the ovary to uh, uh, fertilize the ovules. But the pollen uh, pollinia is what we call it. It's a package. The pollen is not individual grains in an orchid. It's usually packaged up in a clump in a discrete package called a pollinium. And there's usually two. There can be multiples, though. There can be five, six, depending on the genus. But uh, most orchids have at least two pollinia. And they are usually stalked. And at the very end and the tip of that stalk is an extremely sticky pad called the basidium. And that's where uh, it's going to attach to the insect. And the insect is going to pull that out from the uh, structures where the pollinia are, are hidden and then go to the next flower and hopefully pollinate. Uh, orchids are notoriously poor reproducers. They go through this elaborate scheme of, of pollinating and part of the result is that they don't have a very high success rate. Uh, but they go through all of this elaborate mechanism to assure that the uh, genes are transferred to other flowers, that they, they don't self-pollinate very often. They do, but the preferred method, of course, would be to do uh, cross-pollination and so they would have a, a new mixture of genes in the next generation, which would lead to better vigor. Because if you're constantly just using the same genes and self-pollination, you start to amplify any kind of mutation that might be detrimental. And so the whole population tends to weaken over time. So they go through these elaborate schemes to ensure cross-fertilization. Uh, and this is a picture of some orchid seed. And Orchid seed are, are unique in that they don't have any endosperm, so they're unlike any other seed. Um, they're the embryo, and you can see in the kind of the center of the picture there where there's a dark spot, that's an actual embryo. And then there's this kind of husk around it that um, is uh, called the testum or testa, and um, it's very lightweight and porous. And you can see they're only a few millimeters in length. So they're extremely tiny and they can blow, you know, miles and miles and miles in the wind. And so orchids can, can disperse very quickly, very rapidly and to a lot of different habitats. Of course, most of which are not gonna be favorable. But another interesting thing, because they don't have an endosperm, that means that they're going to have to be able to find nutrition somehow when they're beginning to germinate. And so they accomplish this by a mutual symbiotic relationship with a mycorrhizal fungus. So as soon as the orchid seed lands somewhere, it has to have a fungal uh, strand work its way into the testa and start to feed the embryo. And this symbiotic relationship in the wild lasts throughout the entire life of the orchid. Uh, you can artificially propagate uh, orchid seed by, by giving them all the nutrients that they would need in the media that they're growing in. And then once they become adult um, photosynthetic plants, then they're fine without the fungus. But in the wild, these uh, fungal patches will re retain themselves on the roots of an adult orchid plant. And it probably just helps them to maintain a good nutritional uptake throughout their lifespan. But that in itself is another reason that orchids don't reproduce quite readily.
So there's a lot of things that they overcome. And part of the overcoming is they produce thousands and thousands of seeds per pod. So there's mechanisms to balance and orchids uh, in general are pioneer plants. So they, they kind of like disturbed areas within their habitats and that's where they're gonna uh, be able to germinate. All right, so um, probably the most famous uh, example of how far an orchid will go to ensure its uh, reproduction is, it's not a native, this is not a native orchid. These are found in Mediterranean Europe and North Africa. Uh, these are the Ophrises or the bee orchids. Uh, this is the two-moon orchid, Ophrys bilunulata. And what Ophrises have done is through evolution and, and mutual uh, uh, mutualistic uh, arrangements with uh, bees, uh, they fine tune themselves so that they will be pollinated by one specific uh, species. Um, so this lip is kind of fuzzy and has markings on it. And of course, insects don't really see that that much uh, in acuity. They, they are generalists as far as they see colors and botches and, and general shapes and forms, but they're not really that sharply uh, attuned uh, to what the visual cues are. So uh, they, they kind of look like a female bee. And you can kind of see that. And, but they go a step beyond that. Uh, instead of having a fragrance that humans smell, most of these Ophrys orchids have developed uh, fragrances that mimic uh, the female bee pheromones. So the males are attuned to, you know, the pheromones as a sexual attractant, and they go right to where the orchids are blooming and think that these are female bees. And so they uh, see that, land on them, and try to mate with them. And so the method of pollination for these orchids is called pseudocopulation and it's done by these bees and here's an example of an andrina species of bee that's actually thinks it's mating with the flower and you can see the pollinia are attached to its abdomen and he's still you know working away trying to find you know the spot <laughs> and uh, he will eventually uh, stick that pollinia onto the uh, surface of the stigma and then the orchid will be pollinated or he'll go to another flower and carry that pollen and cross pollinate. That's kind of the, uh, the famous kind of exaggerated mechanism that an orchid will go through to uh, ensure its pollination. But some of our native orchids are also just about as um, uh, cunning as far as this goes. So there's basically four types of uh, pollination strategies that our natives employ. Uh, the first is a nectar reward, which is what typically most flowers do. Most flowers will give a nectar reward to their pollinator, and that's what draws them in. Or it could be pollen. You know, a lot of bees gather pollen, and so in the process of gathering pollen, they will also um, pollinate the flowers. And there are things that uh, will attract the insects to that reward. And then there's also, an orchid specifically, a non-reward floral mimicry. So... It takes a lot of energy for the plant to produce nectar. Uh, and so that energy can be better spent producing more seed. And so that's what orchids have done is that they have foregone actually producing nectar, but they'll employ all of the other trappings of the flower that would signal that we're gonna have you know, a reward if you come here. And they're using that to draw in the insect. And of course the insect thinks that it's going to find the nectar and, you know, goes in foraging and gets the pollen on it and pollinates flowers, but doesn't really get a reward for it. Uh, then there's the uh, floral traps. And these are actually uh, mechanisms that temporarily trap or uh, trick an uh, insect into a, a situation that they don't expect. And that's how they uh, will get the pollen on them. We'll go through those. It's hard to explain it until you actually see it. And then the fourth one is a, is a method of self-pollination called clastogamy. And clastogamy means that uh, the, as the flowers are being formed, they uh, pollinate themselves before they even open. And clastogamous flowers do not ever really open. And so they're pollinated and in bud 
and then start to produce uh, mature seed before they would be open and they never open. And it's not the most efficient way. And like I said, over time, it, it will probably be detrimental to the population, but uh, it is a way of ensuring that seed are produced. And a lot of clastogamous plants are relatively short lived perennials. And there are some orchids that only live two or three years and a lot of those will undergo clastogamy. All right, so we'll talk about those that give the nectar reward. And of course, most of these are gonna be uh, pollinated by butterflies and moths and bees. And each individual orchid has a fine tuned uh, set of structures that sort of limit to what, you know, insect it can uh, be pollinated by either the length of the uh, nectar uh, spur or the shape of the flower or the size of the flower. And so you get different insects of different sizes that are pollinating different orchids. Um, and most of those can be recognized by the long spurs where the nectar is contained. And so when you see a, an orchid that has a long spur, and if you look closely, you'll usually see that there's liquid in them. And it's typically only about a quarter to a third of that spur has nectar. So it kind of makes sure that the uh, insect will go all the way in to be able to get all the nectar. And a lot of these uh, flowers are also very fragrant, which also helps attract in uh, the pollinators, especially the moths. So an example of some of these reward giving orchids are the fringed orchids or the platantheras. Uh, and the brightly colored species like this Platanthera ciliaris, they're orange or yellow or purple. Those are all pollinated by butterflies. Now there are also white and green flowered platantheras, and those are usually pollinated by moths. And uh, if anybody's familiar with some of these, you'll know that some have a fragrance and those are typically the moth pollinated ones. So this is an up close view of the flower. And I'm gonna try to use my cursor here to point, so bear with me. So the flower, the lip here is got all these hairs. And what that uh, probably facilitates is the ability for the butterfly to be able to hang on to the flower as it, it searches for the nectar. So this right up here is one of the nectar spurs. It looks very similar to the actual pedicel right here, but this is the spur that contains the nectar. And it's usually, like I said, just at the last quarter tip. Whoop, hit a button. Um, I just want to go back. Uh, but right here is the opening to that nectar spur. And you see it's a little hole. And if you notice these two fangs on either side, well, that's the pollinia. There's a packet here and a packet there. And right at the very tip is that little sticky pad. So the butterfly is gonna come in here, try to get the nectar, and I, I'm touching that too hard or something. Uh, anyway, it's gonna try to get the nectar. And as it gets to the end of the nectar, it's gonna push forward as much as possible into that hole and its head's gonna go right in between those two fangs and the pollinia are gonna to stick to either side of its head. This is uh, the monkey face orchid, uh, Tanthra integra labia. We're all familiar with that one. And this is one that's moth pollinated. And it's, if you've ever been around uh, the monkey face orchids, you know that it has a very strong kind of vanilla almondy uh, fragrance. It's a, a really nice fragrance, but that attracts moths. And also the white color, especially around dusk, will really show up. And so it attracts the moths. Now I've seen butterflies at these two, but I think moths are probably the main pollinator. And, in, and again, you can see the pollinia. And here you can actually see the yellow where the actual packet is versus the white part, which is just the base structure that holds it in place. Also the lips of the spurs are kind of tilted downward and that helps facilitate an uh, insect that's flying and not holding on. So the, the proboscis will just go straight down in and you don't have to position yourself and hold your head straight up like the other one was a, almost a parallel spur. And here's a uh, spice bush swallowtail showing you that it actually does work. And if you notice right here on the side of its head, Usually they're stuck to the eye. There's the basidium right there. And then the packet of pollen is sticking up. And so it's 
pulled away from the flower, it's got pollen now, and it'll go to another flower. And hopefully as it goes in to feed, that pollen packet is gonna stick to the sticky part of the stigma. And then the stigma will attach that and pull and when it pulls back, the pollen will stay behind on the uh, stigma and then it will dissolve and the pollen grains will be released to do the fertilization. And a couple of other orchids that are also pollinated by moths include the shoy orchis and the crane fly orchid. And of course, you know, crane fly orchids flowers are very small. And so it's small moths that uh, fly around and uh, do the pollination on those. And I've been out early in the mornings and I can, uh, you can smell showy orchis. I, a lot of people don't realize they have a fragrance, but if you go early in the morning and I'm assuming probably late in the afternoon at dusk time, uh, it's kind of a spicy uh, clove-like scent and it's, it's quite nice. And another orchid that is um, actually gives a, a, a reward. It's not a lot of nectar, but uh, Speranthes are the ladies' tresses. At the base of the lip has a very small amount of, of nectar. And even though they don't have spurs, it's kind of a little sack back there at the very back of the lip. And you can see the opening right here. Now I've seen, oops, I've seen butterflies on them, but typically um, you will have bumblebees or other larger bees that will um, be the pollinator of these. And what they do is they've got a, a, a long tongue, but it's not as long as a butterfly proboscis. And so they work themselves to the flower and the way that the spiranthes is, is formed, that lip kind of hinges down a little bit. So a bee will push its head in and separate the flower apart to get to that. And the, uh, the, the column is at the very upper part of the dorsal sepal here. So right there in that bend is where the column is and the pollen is in this area. So the bee pushes in and it actually pushes um, in and, and puts the pollen will connect to the back of the head usually as it pulls out. And there's an example here of a Eastern common, uh, Eastern common bumblebee or common Eastern bumblebee um, that has a couple of the pollinia attached to the back of its head as it's pulled out of the flower. And so it'll go to the next flower, do that, and hopefully it'll contact the stigma and the pollen will remove itself and pollinate the flower. You got to remember, all this stuff is very inefficient, though. A lot, of, a lot of insects will visit, get pollen on them, but it won't actually go back and be able to put that onto the stigma. Or the stigma doesn't stick enough uh, to pull it off of the insect. So it's an inefficient way, but it's a good way of assuring cross-fertilization between plants. And then we have the non-reward floral mimicry. And if you're you know, out in the field, you notice that a lot of flowers have these markings on their petals. And usually they're darker lines and sometimes they are visible. And actually sometimes we don't see them because they only show up in UV light, which is what a lot of insects see in. And so, Sometimes a flower doesn't appear to actually have any markings on it, but to an insect, it does. And all of these little lines here in the catalpa and on the uh, glade crest and here on the uh, foxglove, they're basically drawing the uh, insects into where either the nectar or the pollen is going to be. And a lot of these are tube-shaped flowers. And uh, so the insect has to work in, and that's where the uh, pollen will be dispersed onto the insect, even in these plants. So they have to work for it, but they get a reward at the end. Uh, and here's a Parnassus. And so even the green lines on the white background uh, are an attractant to flies and bees, but particularly flies. So we have orchids that have over time developed a similar arrangement, but yet they don't produce pollen or don't, don't produce nectar uh, as a reward. So if you notice, this is a spreading pagonia, Clystes bifaria. And if you look closely here, you see these you know, dark purple lines that are leading to this ridge of purple, which goes back into what now the two petals here, lateral petals, have formed what looks like a tube. And so that will lead the bee 
up through the flower to where the column is in this area where the pollen is. And they work in thinking they're gonna get a nectar reward and yet there isn't one, but they've already gotten pollen on them now. And then they'll go to the next flower and do the same thing. And in the process pollinate. Another one is the crested coral root. You can see the purple lines here. And in this one, the uh, column is part of the tube. And then the lateral sepals kind of in, in, uh, go to the side of it and form the area that the bee goes up. But right there, you can see the pollen packets. So it doesn't have to go very far in there to get the pollen on it. And then the uh, shadow witch orchid, which employs the green lines on the white background. And uh, these are pollinated by flies. And so the flies come and land on this. And you can see right here, the pollen is located here and it's very flat. So the, the plant doesn't have to have anything other than the fly landing on it. And it may attach to its leg or its abdomen, but it will attach uh, because just of the uh, motion of the uh, insect landing on the flower. And then it'll go to the next flower and so on and pass the pollen around. And then you've got the world pagonia, the Isatria verticillata, which kind of employs both mechanisms. So if you look here on the lip, it's white, but it's got a nice green bumpy patch. So that's going to attract flies. It's also got these dark purple areas and lines that go back toward the column, which is just right there. And then the two lateral petals are forming um, the tube. And so that's kind of mimicking all that. But like, again, it doesn't have a nectar reward at the end for the insect. So it's just using what nature's already provided with other flowers to fool the insects to do what it's bidding for pollination. And then there are a lot of wildflowers that mimic the look or the smell of rotten meat, and that attracts pollinator flies. And a few of the uh, plants that we're familiar with are the pawpaw, and you can see these are all either dark maroon or a purplish brown color, which mimics old meat that uh, flies would be attracted to. And many of the flowers have an odor that is not pleasant, not necessarily rotten meat, but an unpleasant odor. Uh, some don't, but they still have the coloration. And so that attracts the uh, flies. And a couple of the orchids will do this too. So this is Southern Tway Blade, Lystra australis. And as you can see, it's got that same deep red color. And these are teeny tiny flowers. Uh, but if you look here, it kind of this looks like little shreds of meat hanging on a stem. And this one even has a little bit of a, a color pad that may attract the, the insects also, but these are all fly pollinated because you can see here's the column and the pollen right here. So it's very flat. So it just has to land on it and then have the pollen stick to it. Uh, lily leaf tway blade, Leparis liliifolia, kind of the same thing, kind of this brown membranous looking uh, flower. The flies land on that and the pollen's connected right there. So as they're kind of walking around here, they'll bump into that, pollen will attach to it. Uh, another thing too, there are species of Leparis that are uh, pollinated by raindrops. So raindrops will hit the, the lip of the flower and it will jar the flower and the pollen will dislodge. And as the drop of rain that has the pollen on it, evaporates, it pushes it back into where the stigma is. It's the only genus of orchids that that kind of pollination mechanism is known. Uh, a lot of orchids also, as they age and senesce the flowers, they will dry up and release the pollen. And some will actually self-fertilize that way. And uh, some of these laparuses will do that. So the pollen kind of dries up and dislodges and falls back down on the lip and through either action of insects landing on it or the wind or whatever, will push it back into the stigma. And occasionally you will get uh, some self-pollination that way. And then there are the floral traps. And this is these are the ones that people really love because it's just ingenious and elegant, the way that they've developed 
their flowers to be able to ensnare an insect to do its pollination bidding. And so we'll go back to our friend, the grass pink, Calipogon tuberosus. And um, like I said, it has a little bit of an unusual structure for an orchid and you'll see why here. So if you look here, this is an up close view of the uh, lip. And it's pretty obvious that these little hair-like projections are mimicking stamens and pollen, an anthers, you know. So it looks like the stamens of a flower and that's gonna attract the bee. So the bee is going to land up here thinking, oh, this is pollen. Well, when it lands, and of course, a, you know, a, a small bumblebee is still pretty heavy when it comes to a flower. And if you look right here, there's a notch and that's called the hinge. And up here is a closer view of it. And it's hard to see here, but there is a line that, of pale color, which is actually an area where there's much fewer cells stacked on each other so it's a weak point and what happens is the bee will land here and the weight will tr trigger the collapse of that lip and so where the bees landed will fall completely back down onto this area where the pollen is and on the column so this is the structure of this flower is wow. specifically designed to be able to handle a bee as it falls back when the hinge breaks it doesn't break, it just bends. But when that hinge goes, the bee falls, its back hits the pollen, the pollen sticks to it, and of course it flies off. And then we have the lady slippers, and they're also insect traps. So this is Cypripedium kentuckiense, and this is a close-up view of the what we call the pouch or the slipper. And if you notice, you can see right here, there's the opening. And that opening goes all the way around. But you also notice there's this flap that hangs back down within the pouch. And that completely surrounds this. So it's almost like a fish trap in that there's a funnel in. But because that sticks inward and then the uh, insect can't get back out that way because the flap is kind of forcing it to not be able to get back out that way. So. If you look here, there are some clear areas on the back side of the pouch, and those act as windows and kind of let light in. So the, the most light's coming here, and the insect will probably try to go right back out where it came in, but it can't. But here it sees more lights, which says, okay, I'm going to go this way. And if you notice here, there's all these little hairs. Well, this streak of hair goes all the way down the back side of the lip. And that's the only way because all the other part of the inside of the lip is very smooth and they can't really climb out. So they go up through here and this is the only opening, this little area right here. They're gonna have to squeeze themselves through there to get out. And right there is the pollen package. And, and these uh, pollinia don't really have a basidium. The, the pollen's like a really sticky goo, goo. And so as they work their way past, the pollen will kind of stick to the uh, backside of the, of the bee. And right behind here, this is a, what they call a staminode. And that's kind of unique to uh, lady slippers. And that kind of helps keep this pouch from being able to be opened up before then. And it forces it to go out this way. But right behind this is where the stigma is. So it's gonna get, pollen stuck to it the first time it goes through. It's pretty traumatic for a bee, if you can imagine. So they're going to have to do this all over again. And a lot of bees learn right away. This isn't worth it. This flower didn't have anything but just a hard time. So they're not going to go back. But occasionally you get a bee that's a little naive still and will go back to a second flower. And that's the ones that are doing the pollination. So the Cypripedium kentuckiense grows up on our farm in Parsons and uh, I kind of monitored these uh, plants for about 20, 25 years, pretty much every year. And I would have uh, occasionally go up and hand pollinate a few. I'd take the pollen from one and go to another flower and pollinate that by hand. And I was trying to increase the population, but I never saw any pods that were seed pods that were formed naturally until one year 
every single flower that bloomed had a seed pod. And I didn't do any pollination that year myself. So I don't know, I've, I've read a lot of, about uh, pollination in the cypripediums and talked to some people. And it seems like that a lot of times the flowers don't time up well with the bee emergence. And so by the time that the naive, naive bees have come out, they've learned to go to other flowers. So I think that there's a lot of um, uh, years where the pollinators just don't even visit uh, lady slippers. And that's why they're so difficult to, um, to uh, spread and kind of probably leads to a lot of their rarity. But it's just an interesting side note that they, they seem to rarely get pollinated uh, by natural means. But when it does happen, it seems to be very efficient. And this is uh, the pink lady slipper. It has a, a slightly different arrangement, although the mechanisms are the same. So if you look here, um, it's got these dark lines, which is another thing like before the mimicry, which says, you know, come here, come here. But it has an extremely small opening. So it's not big enough for a bee. But if people have, if you've ever, you know, played and touched with a, um, a lady slipper pouch or a pink lady slipper pouch, you'll know that it's very flexible and and loose, and this is actually a slit. So it's actually the opening goes all the way down the length of the, the pouch, but it's kind of closed off with that flap that hangs back down. So what happens is the, uh, the bumblebee will come here because of the lines and it says, oh, here's the opening and it will work its way through. And if you've noticed bumblebees working, you know, um, some of the snapdragons and flowers like that, they push their way into the flower to get to the nectar. And so that's what it's doing with the uh, pink lady slipper. It'll push its way in, but then it gets trapped and there's no way it can get back out. Even if it's flexible, these, these flaps don't go back out. And so he has to come back out the top here. And so here's the opening here on the back side of the pouch. So it's gonna have to go out that way. And of course, get the pollen on it. And then the, uh, the last strategy that our native orchids and uh, are, are utilizing is clystogamy and it's rare it's not like i said it's not the the most favorable way to maintain a population so clystogamous flowers are not the first choice but they do happen and they happen in a lot of different wildflowers uh, most notably uh, there are several peas that do that uh, one of the things that does that is a peanut a peanut is actually a clystogamous flower so we're eating the seeds from a clystogamous flower when we eat a peanut uh, several grasses will do this, and also violets. Violets are very uh, notorious for clystogamous flowers. And so this is a diagram of a violet. This was the flower that opened up in the early spring and was fertilized by you know, normal means and cross-pollination more than likely. And it's already dehissed and the seeds have dispersed from the fruit capsule. But now it's later in summer and kind of as an insurance that it's gonna be able to reproduce, it sends out these clystogamous flowers and these don't ever open. They're basically, they look like a seed pod as they're forming and they do, they just make seed. They don't have petals or anything like that. And then they will rupture later on and disperse seed. Of course, these are all self-pollinated. So it's not the preferred way, but it will work. And especially if it didn't get pollinated earlier when it had the normal open flower. So in orchids, uh, you get uh, some of the sporanthes will do this. This is the oval lady uh, tresses or sporanthes ovalis. And you'll notice that these flowers just look like buds. And you can also tell that the ovaries are already swelling up and the flowers really never completely open up. They may break a little bit open, but not enough for anything to get in. And so these are gonna be self-pollinating. And, and a lot of times these orchids will do this if the conditions are not right. Uh, and they haven't been able to manufacture nectar, the energy, they don't wanna, they don't ex, they wanna expend that much energy to form uh, open flowers and produce nectar. So they'll just do these clastogamous flowers. And probably the one that most people are familiar with is the coral roots and especially fall coral root. And 
bob coral coral root will actually rarely produce open flowers most of the time when you encounter these out you will see the clastogamous flowers and so this is the flower right there that little nub and it's already produced uh you know a seed capsule as it's maturing and so that's how it it does its thing is just basically self-pollination over and over and when conditions are perfect then they'll produce open flowers and hope for cross-pollination to maintain the gene diversity within the population there. And so that's how our native orchids employ different strategies to ensure reproduction. A lot of them are very elaborate, elegant traps. Some just give you nectar like normal flowers and others are gonna be self-pollinating uh, flowers that never open. And with that, I thank you very much. And we'll start with any questions that anybody might have. Wow. Thank you, Bart. Um, I, I've been around orchids all my life. I found my first pink lady slipper back when I was, oh, maybe seven or eight years old. But I've never knew how they pollinated. So thank you. Um, Mark H. says, uh fantastic presentation thank you thank Gary you Joyce fascinating thank you um yes I enjoyed very much this is Edwin and Nichols and I do have a question okay. on the far away well that on the self block that was fantastic and uh, all uh, a lot of stuff were were back to things that I have uh, uh, learned over the decades and on the Tupolaya discolor uh, the, arra the arrangement of flowers is such that they cannot go easily from one flower pathways to the other so if you think you have the arrangement one on top of the other interspaced that's when the when the that particular moss is supposedly going straight up that one line and not go zigzag from one to the other i right. read that on one of the literatures yep and they're also slightly nodding which also makes it difficult to go from one flower up to another one absolute yep and and you try to take pictures of them and uh, that's a challenge on its own, but the, yeah. the symmetry and asymmetry in the arrangement of those flowers and others too, but that's just, just terrific. Yep. Yep. This is it when it nickels yeah. and I have about the pods on the self pollinators. Uh -huh. Can you from the pod, if you take it off of the plant, can you well, yeah, I mean, orchids, orchids are, are very difficult to, you know, raise from seed. Um, like I said, you know, an orchid seed has to have that mycorrhizal fungal partner. So if you don't have the correct fungus, and that's why it's, it's if you want to try to raise babies, it's better to just let the seed pods, you know, burst and fall in the area where the orchids are already located, because you know that if the orchid is there, you're going to have that fungus present. And so it would be very difficult to like try to take that pod and then move it somewhere else and try to plant the seed. And you don't really plant the seed. They just have to fall down into the top of the soil and under the leaf litter and all that. But yeah. Okay, now I have mine in the bark and the other stuff that uh, holds the, the moisture. Uh -huh. So seeds drop on my orchids does that is that where they go and and they're going to produce more into that medium or do i need to have them in some kind of dirt well it like i said to 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 grow terrestrials i only know of one terrestrial orchid that's grown in cultivation that really is fairly easy to propagate and i've done it and that's a uh, sonorcus fastigiata and it's one of those that when you let them go to seed and the pod pops open and the seed disperses, 
it will come up in all of your pots. It's it's very prolific. Okay. Uh, any other type of orchid, it I mean, you can occasionally, and that's how they when they originally started to try to propagate orchids, that's what they would do is they would let the seed pod burst and the seed fall down into the pot where the mother plant was. And occasionally, a rare occasion, they would get a seedling come up. Now, another thing about an orchid is the first year of an orchid's life, you don't see anything. Because when it germinates, it basically just makes a ball of cells. And then the second year, it will start to make leaves and roots. Okay. Okay. And, and then it will grow from then on as you know a, a normal plant. But that first year, it's basically a mass of cells. And eventually they start to grow a leaf out from that mass and then roots. Okay. So that's why most people do all of the, um, any kind of uh, seed germination, they do it in sterile tissue culture with media that contains all the nutrients. They don't worry about the, the fungus. That's, that's why it's basically a professional lab job that people that work on orchid propagation. <clears throat> it's difficult. Okay. All right, we have a comment from uh, Mrs. Bob Davis. She says, we have spiranthes in our yard every year, but not always in the same place. What's up with that? Well, like I said, you know, spiranthes are probably one of these uh, short-lived perennials. So a spiranthes plant, individual plant, probably doesn't live more than four or five years. And so that's one of the reasons that you get to this clastogamous uh, method because if the plant's getting older and it's not been producing seed pods, it may revert to this clastogamy to ensure that it can reproduce. And then it may die off. You know, a lot of, a lot of plants may live several years until they're old enough to uh, reproduce. And then after they reproduce, they die. I'm not saying that an orchid does that, but some of these short-lived perennials, they, they, don't, they don't have a lot of flowering seasons in them and so what will happen is you may have spiranthes come up in one spot for a year or two they bloom and then they die and then they'll come up in another location from seed from a year or two ago and then they'll bloom so it's this constant flux within the area but not in the exact location what about the time from seed to flowering uh, of course that's going to depend on different species but in general Orchids are a little bit like trilliums. It's going to take five to seven years. Some are faster. Some of the smaller, like uh, Spiranthes, will probably bloom within three years, probably. And then we have uh, another question. Can you talk about the soil characteristics needed for orchids? Why are they so hard to move? Well, the main thing is just because... Um, the fungal association is still there. And if you move the plant to a different location, it could also be that you're killing the fungus more so than you're killing the plant. And once the fungus is uh, dead, the plant may not thrive as well. Uh, also the conditions, you know, orchids are gonna grow where they're happy. And that's why I'm saying, transplanting plants away from where they're growing to a different location where they're not growing probably means that 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 location is not as good. And so the more sensitive the plant is to that, the more likely it's not gonna transplant. And orchids kind of fall into that territory. So if you're going to try to do that, you need to bring a lot, and we I do not advocate moving orchids, uh, especially the lady slippers. Uh, they're, they're too rare and they don't transplant well at all. Uh, people have tried and tried with pink lady slippers, and unless you've got pine woods and acid soil, you're wasting your time. So I don't advocate for that, but maybe a spiranthes or a tipularia, which is a common plant, they're not going to live a long time anyway. You might could try to move those. Um, but if you do, you need to be sure to bring a lot of the native soil that it came, uh, that it was growing in to begin with and uh, make sure that it's got the same kind of drainage. So if it was a dry location, you definitely need to put it in a relatively dry location. If it was a moist location, it has to be moist. You need to try to mimic the conditions as much as you can. Here's one from Rita. 
Okay, go ahead, Karen. If the bees, whoops, let's see here. If the bees can learn not to return again and again to the lady slippers, why do you think they don't learn from the non-floral mimicry of the spreading pagonia? Um, they probably do. Uh, but you also got to remember, too, that all flowers, even the ones that produce nectar, they produce nectar at different times of the day. Uh, if an insect has already visited that flower, it may not have nectar. So it's not like it's just a complete turnoff not to get nectar from one flower. Now, if they repeatedly went to that same type of flower over and over and never got nectar, yeah, they might finally give up on that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean... And, and yeah, like I said, orchids are not, it's not efficient. They're using these insects, but they're pretty harsh methods of using them. And so they learn pretty quick that I'm not getting anything out of this. And so, yeah, you don't get orchid pollination on every plant. All right. Barrett Brannan says, great presentation. Pretty fascinating to think these orchids would not exist if the fungus didn't provide energy to the seeds. Yep. Yep. And another one says colonies of Goderia can be seen on numerous wooded trails. So they like that. Place. I didn't hear what, what genus? Goodyear. Oh, Goodyear. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and Goodyear is one of the, uh, really more common orchids and like i said orchids in a way are pioneer plants we don't think of them that way because we think that they're real finicky and picky and in a way they are but they also kind of depend on that disturbance and so good yarrows will grow right along a trail that you know kind of gets kicked up a little bit every so often and then John White comments that maybe the, the answer to the question about the non-learning bees is bees as a whole don't live that long. So um, maybe new naive bees will come to the orchids. Good thought. Any more questions? Well, the, the koala hits so, up. Koala Hitza Wisteriana. Uh, I got so excited when in 1959 or 61, I uh, I found it on the mountain, used to mark it, and never was it coming up at the next uh, at the next year on that spot. And also, all vegetation is changing at any spot. So it gets denser and other things will crowd in and, uh, and crowd other plants, uh, especially orchids, crowd them out with, uh, with the forest and so. But uh, as Talame talks about the oak forest, so the Visteriana was uh, very prevalent at those times, but it has over the decades disappeared. Yeah, and, an and another thing about coral roots, because they're not photosynthetic and they're not, they're not oh. parasites, but they're saprophytic. They're saprophytes, right. Yeah, so they, they get their energy from decaying organic matter. And if you can imagine, if you had to live on rotten, rotting stuff all the time, that it would probably take you a long time to gain enough energy to be able to bloom. And so the only time that you ever see a coral root is when it's blooming. The rest of the time, and it may be years, you know, several years in between the time it can bloom. So it's underground. And so that's what happens a lot of times. People will see a coral root and they, they see it when it's in flower, go and mark it, and then it, it may not be there for the next several years. And they give up, think it's dead. And it could just be that it's doing its thing underground, gaining energy, and then 10 years later, it blooms again in that spot, or it may die out. That's I mean, they also don't have uh, chlorophyll. Right. So, I mean, it, it's, it's an it's odd apple, orchid. It's... And that's another reason why they believe that a lot of the coral roots will do the clastogamy because when they do bloom, they have to ensure that they've gotten their job accomplished because they may not bloom again. Any other questions? 
Uh, Vart, I think this was fabulous. It was fun. Um, I sure learned a lot. And I appreciate what you've, the work that you put into this presentation. It was a good one. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Uh, lots of comments here now, suddenly. <laughs> oh, they just all... Mostly That's they're... Great. Thanks so much. This type of study is much needed for other wildflower families. That's from Rita. Uh, Hunter Oppenheimer, just fascinating. Thank you. Sarah Thomas, so interesting. Thank you. Henry, good presentation. Uh, Dana DeLoca, thanks for the wonderful presentation. John White, great photographs. They are. Thank you, Bart. Much Thank appreciated. You. Very good. So, well, Bob, I could continue that uh, discussion with you from now until infinity. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the great thing about plants? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. Well, thank you very much. With that, folks, I'm going to say good night. Night. Thank you for right. coming, and we've enjoyed everyone. Good night. Good night. All right. Thank good you, night. Bart. Good night. Thank you. Good night, good night. And, and and thank you, and uh, uh, I've. I found it, Karen, I found it under search. Thank you. Glad you did. Right. All right. Don't know where it had gone in the meanwhile. All right. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Good night. But, uh, good night. And Bart, I'm going to call you soon on a okay. fascinating bug. Okay. <laughs> which you won't know. Or it's oh, okay. Because I read it in the German book. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, yeah, I won't know that. The details. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Good night. Shirley, are you still there? You're muted. To you unmute yourself. I could hear you. Now, can you hear me? Yes. You unmuted I yourself. I did. And uh, uh, anyway, I hooked in a little.